Yeah, man. So it's been five years. A lot's happened in five years, but five years, man. I think that you were touring with uh, Circus Survive the last time I saw you, man. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, yeah. You're right. We met in 2013, and I last saw you in 2015. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. As if it's 2013. Yes, it was. Yes. It was. Did I yeah. have? A, did I have? I, I had Isla then, didn't I? Yes, I believe you did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. So so, how are you, dude? You good? I'm good, man. Overall, a uh, lot to be grateful for. Obviously, we all have a lot to be stressed about, but uh, yeah. overall, I'm good. Yeah, man. Yeah, it is. It's weird. It's like it, it's like the whole. It's weird at the moment because with the first thing that was going on, like the whole world was feeling it, you know. And then, and then, just as it couldn't get any worse, what happened happened, and it's just kicked. It's just everyone's so hurt. It's just kicked everything off, and it's just it's intense at the moment. It feels so strange. It just feels so strange. It does feel strange. Unfortunately, a lot of this uh, conflict is happening because I think uh, not enough fe- people, at least in our country, are feeling hurt, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe th- this, th- it's so hard. It's so hard because it's just like, everybody was so highly strung anyway because everybody's not earning and, um, you know, there's no, there's a massive, massive unemployment and then it just needed something like this, and it's just it just made everyone stand up. I don't know. It's it's intense. It's definitely intense. It, I can't imagine what what the world's gonna have to what what the rest of this year is gonna be like. To be honest, because it's been it feels like this year is like just a write off to a certain degree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I feel kind of cliche saying it, but. Uh... <laughs> It's pretty true. Like 2020 has shaped up to be so just so extreme. And I'm somebody that's already lived such an extreme life at times that it's kind of hard for me to be shocked and just uh, beside myself by circumstances. Me, man, I, I am but human. And I found myself just, wow, tripping and dealing with so many different things. But, uh, Again, not to sound cliche, for me, one of the main grounding uh, and anchoring things is to always return to gratitude, Um, not because it's some sort of frou-frou prepackaged ideology that's going to solve everything, but it's just a really powerful way of me connecting with uh, my reality and the reality that we're forced to share with other people in a real way, in a good way. So. Yeah. Oh man, I completely understand. Yeah, yeah, I, I think as well, like, cause you, it started off so, so good as well. You guys played a show, didn't you? The RX Bandits played a show this year. Yeah, and I'm just, again, it sucks that our whole tour, like last weekend, was supposed to be the first uh, run of shows of our tour, and I'm bummed that that happened. But at the same time, like, how lucky are we that we got to still sneak one in at the end of January, where I had already still heard about the pandemic, but. It hadn't really gone full scale. Yeah. And uh, all of our shows are always good, and I try to appreciate them, but it was such a special show in particular. People coming from around the world because we had only announced one, and we're just like, well, you know, this is this is the only show. So I just feel really lucky that everybody got to go. Everybody had a great time, and I've gotten so much positive feedback from people being like, it was the last show I saw, but uh, I'm so glad that it was. And Man, hearing that never gets old. It's like I appreciate so so much every time anybody says that. So it's awesome. Yeah, like it, it it's almost a certain. It's, you could coin the terms. It is it coined the term. Like uh, to him, it is what it is. You know what I mean? It, sometimes things just happen, and it was weird though that gig because I wasn't even there. It was like so far away. But even just by the social media posts and 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 the feeling around it, you could feel the energy. And I wasn't even there. I didn't really hear any. I could see like videos from it, but you could just tell that the energy from that show. There's so much like, uh, like pent up progressive love to a certain degree. Like as if people have been waiting to hear you guys live for for so long. Especially with Chris as well on drums. You know, they were just like, yeah. and then they eventually they got it, and it was just like ugh, super intense. You know. It was super intense. I mean, already, uh, we already have such enthusiastic fans, you know, but um, I I just am still thinking about it. I'm still overwhelmed because we're an older band and so many older bands have so much trouble uh, staying, 
I guess what they would deem as relevant. Like we're, we're, we don't really care about staying relevant. We just care about yeah. retaining our relationship with our fans. And the, I'm still amazed at how many people stick with us. And I feel like we're still kind of growing on this slow, steady way. And it makes me just feel so lucky. I'm like, damn, like there's bands I'm seeing that were selling out 3000 cap uh, venues, but four years ago, and now they cannot even fill 200 cap venues. And like, you know, here we are being able to still do this, you know, um, even at a house of blues, that's double the size of the old one and still sell it out. So yeah. so much uh, love and appreciation and gratitude to everybody, you know, that supports us still, no matter what project it is. It's just awesome. man. We're really lucky. Yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I, I don't think, I don't think it's uh, look, look, Steve, I think your band is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I think, you know, the more people that are, because when I first came to hear it, it was Lee that passed me um, and the battle begun. Same. And he was just like, have a listen to this. And it's all <laughs> of a sudden you get hit by this wave of like, what is this? This is amazing. Um, and I, I don't think it's look at all. I think you're all um, really, really talented individually. Um, but obviously when you come together, it's, it's this, uh, you know, sonic cooking experience and, yeah. you can't you can't say that's look that is that's not look that's talent and um i wanted to ask you something uh, about about the band and that was um chris how what's chris like to play uh with as a drummer because he seems so loose but so tight and every time me and lee sort of talk about it he's like he's like the loosest yeah. tightest drummer you've got you, you know you've ever heard he's just yeah. like it, it doesn't seem like it should be tight but it is but yeah, it's so loose. It's, it's a very strange way of playing drums. And it's almost, yeah. you know, like it, we, we, we were self-taught and you can see people that have uh, not got sort of like a classical training. And Chris seems to remind me of somebody that would, would have been self-taught. Um, so I don't know if you can like elaborate on what it's like to play with him. But... Sure, yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your very kind words, man. Um, and I think that you know, early on 20 years ago, 21 years ago, when we first saw Seagak, as we call him, Chris, um, play, I said those exact same words verbatim. It's so loose, but so tight. <laughs> and I was joking that uh, the first time I saw them play before I was like officially in the band, I would watch him play and think it was like kind of loose and sloppy. But then I'd close my eyes or look away and listen. And it sounded so tight. Like the groove was in the perfect part of the pocket. He was laid back everything like everything he's able to do that so many other drummers like may not just grasp like his ability to manipulate the tempo of fills yeah. so like the tendency of most drummers in especially more frenetic um, music is to rush fills you're keeping a, a time but then when you get through the fill you're actually not giving it the same amount of time whether it's like a milliseconds or even fractions of a whole second uh, shorter in that drastically affects the feel of, of music. Um, so with him being able to do that and already having such a natural groove, that's like really, really good. Um, it makes it, well, to answer your question directly, it makes it a pleasure to play with. Like it allows us to go way more wild with off time, odd time, free time stuff. Um, and still find that spot which you know we've been so familiar with each other as musicians for decades now um and have it being you know closer to uh the t as tight as we want it so it's those little details of his playing that make it so so good and such a pleasure to play with aside from the unique and like completely uh I don't know how else to say it, but unique uh, and awesome uh, stylistic choices that he makes. I mean, he thinks of stuff that I'm, even now I'm like, oh, we were 23 or 24. Like, man, that was sick. Like, how did he think of doing that? <laughs> that yeah, was awesome, yeah. you know? Yeah, so, it's, it's um, weird because like when you, when you, when, if you listen to say the, the RX Bandix back catalog and you listen to like the very first few albums, he was a super amazing ska drummer, you know, like, uh, uh, like really was really was. And then just slowly as like, say you came on board, 
started to make a little bit more of a progressive approach to the music, you know, playing in odd timing, you know, adding these extra bits in, you know, uh, certain breakdowns coming in at certain parts. It, he just grew with it as well. You could just tell with everything, you know, straight through to uh, And the Battle Begun and so on. Like you could just, in the resignation actually, in resignation, just seeing him slowly just develop this style of playing, you know, I think that's what I was super stoked about seeing when I first came, when I first came to see you in Manchester. And I remember I came right to the front. You guys were sound checking. I think you were setting up. And he came on, he came on and just started setting his drums up. And he's just, I was always like super ready to see that guy just play. And he was just playing around. He's just playing. And you could tell he's just got this loose approach. And like Joe said, like the idea of, um, you could tell he's self-taught to a certain degree, you know, like but just because of the way he is loose. But like, again, how hard it is to like actually vocalize just how tight he is as well. It's, it's a really amazing approach. And not only that, like, his energy as well if you ever if anybody's if nobody's ever seen the rx bandits play live or if you have if you have you'll totally understand what we're saying just the energy that he seems to give the whole band because it's not just because they're like it's like the heart of the band isn't it the drummer you know like everything else plays in with it you know they've got joe joe troy on bass and and then you guys coming on a guitar like the drummer is the beating heart and like to have chris as the beating heart is ridiculous yeah we're lucky to play with him. I'm lucky to just get to play with amazing drummers like him. So yeah, I'm stoked. Yeah, man. But like from the very, like, when did, did you, you came in on resignation, didn't you, Steve? Um, or was that it just was my before? first official album. I did work with them to a certain degree on progress, but progress, I didn't yeah. end up recording on the album. Um, but uh, yeah, officially uh, resignation, which is, obviously why you hear the most like the biggest leap in stylistic change yeah because you know it's not all due to me um we had already been friends and we were listening to the same stuff and we had resonated the same musical ideas and desires to move away from what they were in high school because we listened to like we we were all mega fugazi fans we listened to a lot wow. of jade tree records like early technical indie rock and shit like you know we loved Joan of Arc. We love like a lot of the bands of this era and um, Don Caballero and all these, all these bands. So uh, we knew that taking uh, the lead from honestly, like bands like Bad Brains and The Clash, that people who don't really understand them think they're one thing. But when you really understand these mm -hmm. bands, you understand how much they paved the way for being like kind of, uh, we don't care about genres. We want to play music we like. We're going to mix it how we like. And although uh, there's a lot of commonalities between The Clash and Bad Brains, like they did it in different ways. And we really wanted to take that idea and then infuse our own ingredients, which is a very, uh, I guess, a, a shortened version of explaining the process of how we got to where we were, especially jumping from earlier ska, ska punk stuff to the resignation and on. So, yeah, because yeah. it was still in resignation. There were still moments of ska, you know, uh, in, in the album. So you could see it slowly waned its way out. Obviously, it's, but then again, even in, in the And the Battle Begun, there were still remnants of, uh, of like the, the early days. But I don't know. I just love seeing yeah. that evolution. And like you say, though, I think there's something to that, though. I, I, Joe, you'll speak to it as well. When we, when we first around about the early 2000s, uh, 2003, 2004, you just become more interested in music that was, that was scurrying between genres of music that wasn't just like focusing on one or the other, it was actually picking them and, and choosing and, and, and trying to mold uh, certain genres into one style. Uh, and sometimes some bands could do it and sometimes some bands couldn't. So like some bands could do it and you were like, Oh, it sounds like they're trying to do everything all at once, you know? And, <laughs> and, and then some bands where it was like, I think with the bandits, for me, in my, in my opinion, I don't know, it just seemed to, the songs came to, seemed to take you on a ride, but it would never be too intense. It would never be too cluttered. It would be super readable and consumable, but at the same time, insanely progressive as well. I thought, you know what I mean? I, Obviously, it got more progressive as it's gotten more progressive as time's gone on. But how yeah, does 
sorry, Lee, to cut you off okay. there. How does how do you go about uh, with the writing, Steve? Is it you know because you were saying that the direction obviously didn't change solely because of you, and it was what you were listening to. Um, but do you could do you do you bring an idea forwards, and then a, a song gets wrote around that, or is it Matt that brings yeah. you know the lyrics in um, first? And there's a few main avenues that ideas come through. So. I would say the most common ones would be Matt bringing ideas and me bringing ideas. Um, the first song we ever wrote together was uh, one of the times that Matt and I go 50, 50, meaning it's kind of a combination of both of our ideas, which right. was a song called mastering the list. We did that. We wrote it and recorded in the studio in two days. Oh, um, wow. It was for a, uh, the former label we were on, which whose name I won't mention. Mm -hmm. just because they don't deserve it. But uh, <laughs> uh, that was the first song we wrote. So uh, Matt and I kind of combining our ideas is one of the main ways. Um, then there would be the idea starting with Matt, uh, which would be a lot of the more soulful, mellow songs, the apparitions or the serpents and stuff yeah. like that. Then there would be the songs that start with me that are my ideas specifically, which are, generally speaking like the longer uh more technical like weird punky indie stuff everything from like dinner dogs to decrescendos to uh yeah. you know it's only another parsec like the guitar hero song and stuff like that <laughs> and then there's definitely um a good amount of uh parts that are added to those ideas that start with either matt or me or matt and i together where we jam with the whole band, you know? Um, yeah. Because even though the ideas start with us, uh, these concepts don't get finished with just us. It's very important yeah. that everybody else is adding their stuff, uh, namely Seagak, just because, you know, we could send them in a direction with, well, we want this part to be halftime. We'll go full-time here. But other than that, like the signatures of, you know, how he was going to play the beat, the feel, the fills and stuff, uh, not only did they dictate more of the direction in the song, but it also in a great collaborative setting in any medium, as you guys would know, is that interplay between like, I love that. It gives me an idea. Mm, he loves yeah, that. Yeah. It gives him an idea and it just goes back and forth. You know, sometimes that goes the opposite, direct, opposite direction and people aren't seeing eye to eye on where to go stylistically, <laughs> which can happen too. But uh, we were lucky because, you know, um, we had our own conflicts like any young dumb kids trying to figure their shit out have, but we kind of uh, were lucky enough to use that to fuel our music where we had this little bit of competition within each other, you know, and I, it was such a huge part of the energy of our music, especially the angst of the resignation. Yeah. Yeah. And you can tell as well, like you were saying there, there's, when you actually do point it out, there are more. There, you, you can actually tell that there are tracks that have you written all over them. You know what I mean? That, and then you can tell, like you were saying, when you're pointing Matt's parts out, the more melodic, just relaxed. You know, like bringing it back down so yeah. he can, so he can sing and use his voice, and you know. Um, and then, like, like I was thinking when you're saying it, there's certain tracks that that literally they've got to have involved Chris, you know, like in her draw, you know, I know there might have been, you know, the, uh, the choruses and, and, and the verses that were already written, but they had to become the drums first to a certain degree, you know, with certain beats and stuff like that. It's got, to, it's hard because it's like the band is a collaborative effort. You can tell, but it's got to come from like two or, or three people main or, or like one or two people. It's never really, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to vocalize that, but you can tell that you and Matt, have really like steered the, the the sound of it. You know what I mean? I, were you were you um, a, a guitar player first, or did you pick up the piano first, Steve? Which which no. which came first? Uh, to be honest, I don't really consider myself to be a real guitarist <laughs> even now. Because <laughs> stop it now. <laughs> because no, I, it's, it's it's not it's not false modesty. I, I promise you. Um, I just have like really small shitty hands for guitar and, and like <laughs> Matt's, ab Matt's ability on the actual instrument of the guitar is so far beyond mine. But anyway, to answer your question, um, I didn't even start playing guitar seriously until I was like 17 or 18. It was like one of the last instruments that I started playing seriously. So I did start piano first and that was way earlier. Like I started playing classical music 
with first the piano when I was four. So that was my oh, first instrument okay. at four years old. And then I had the cello at like eight or nine. And then it kind of just went on from there where I started getting into rock and jazz. I started playing drums, bass, stand-up bass, percussion. Then I got into marching band, drum corps. Then I started, you know, just moving on from there. So, uh, yeah, but piano is where it all started. So was that um, influenced from your, obviously at four years old, that must have been the influence of your parents. Were your parents musicians or...? Yeah, it's funny is that I come from a completely non-musical family. <laughs> like nobody, no, nobody in my family plays music. They all like music. They all listen to yeah. music. I mean, I wasn't lucky enough to grow up with like parents that were listening to Zeppelin or or went to see Hendrix or whatever. But, you know, um, as standard music listeners, they listen to a lot of really good classical and Beatles and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it it was my parents kind of just like any parent, especially uh, Asian parents, Korean parents being like, this is for the enrichment of the mind. Obviously when he's a teenager, like we can't make him stick with it, but you know, uh, as kind of just part of his education and us raising him, you know, among doing activities and sports, he will play piano, he will learn to speak another language and that kind of stuff. So um, at first it, it was that, um, but uh everything else it was like my mom even told me like a few years in like you know you want to do this you want to keep going with this like i will but it's fine like i'm not going to make you keep going with this but if you choose to keep going with it i'm not going to let you quit you're going to have to practice and like see this through properly so yeah right right so so obviously you're you're an accomplished musician At, at, at what point were you did you realize that you could make a career out of this? Um, and sort of how many hours were you dedicating to your instruments as such? Cause it sounds like you've, you've, you've tried everything there. Um, a day, was it, you know, was it every day, all day, every day or? Mostly, um, even by the time I was in junior high, high school, aside from like skateboarding and whatever, like random school sports I did, I was just thinking about consuming uh, music all the time because for me it was a huge part of my identity it was a huge part of finding who i was um Mm -hmm. because it's a whole other subject but i grew up in a smaller northern california town where i was like one of four asian kids so while i don't have it as bad as a lot of people do with racial marginalization and stuff i had my fair share enough for like uh a weak-minded, insecure kid like me to really affect me right so for me to find like punk rock and and uh just music and rock in general, like the first time I heard Nirvana and stuff like that, it really helped give me confidence in just like finding who I was and then finding something that uh, later on in high school, not not only that I loved, that other people really liked too and appreciated. And so it really helped me. um, And I feel really lucky because I feel like if I didn't have that, I could have easily turned out to be like real bitter, real bitter at people, real bitter at life because I already have like... uh, the ability to go there in my mind. So, um, okay. Yeah. But to answer your original question more directly, I, I'm not sure I, uh, ever really got to that place where I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm set. Like I I'm good. Like I can make a living. It's like with the way the state of the music industry has been and is, it's always like kind of a hustle. And while we have to appreciate the success that we've had, it's never, ever been like, on this like well we're made you know type thing so um i constantly have in the past gone through am i doing something reasonable with my life that i can make a living and like you know like support myself and a family one day and stuff or am i not you know what i mean but uh at the end of the day we have and i feel very lucky and very grateful so, yeah, yeah, it's always it's always weird the cross the 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 pay up, the playoff of finding something that will give you a career and and, and give you money to obviously live etc. And doing something that you love, and they always talk about that being like the golden thing, isn't it? You got to find something you love, and then you'll never work a day in your life. And I, I, being a musician was always one of those where I remember being with Joe. And me and Joe used to be in bands. And I just used to I want to love the idea of being able to tour and 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 and. And then as you get older, you realize, I realize that I, I myself hadn't fallen into a, a consumable band enough to, 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 to be able to, to do actually make money if you, unless you were going to be in a function band or like, you know, be playing Stevie yeah. Wonder covers and things like that. And, totally. you know, I, we, I know, I know musicians that grew up around our area that were unbelievable and 
they don't play anymore. You know, like there's, there's people out there that, that like, they're so incredible in their instruments and they get beat down so much that they're just like, I'm going to have to find something else to do. And they, they go down another it's path true. and they don't make music. It, it, I think it's the, the craziest thing about music or, or being in a band or finding a band to be in is you literally have to find the right concoction of humans to create music that will entertain other humans enough that you can create a legion of fans that will keep you going and, and will, you know, will, will consume your music to a certain degree, but finding that right concoction. So like, you know, like your Nirvana for, for Kurt Cobain to have found Dave Grohl and, and Chris Novoselic, you know, and things like that, you know, or like, for example, yeah. we're talking to you, like you guys to have found each other um, or for you to have come in and offered a different approach to certain things, because like, you know, the, it's always the case, isn't it? It's, it there's, there's so many different cooks will, will make a, a, a different meal, but we're like with music, it's, it's definitely like that because the change was 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 apparent when you came in to me anyway. But do, did you would you say that your guitar playing completely changed direction when you met Matt? Do you know? Have you really inspired each other that much that it that it you changed yeah. your style to a certain degree? I, I think that my guitar playing became legitimate with Matt, even though I was already trying to get better. He was already so good at the guitar then that he influenced me in that I all of a sudden needed to study metal and blues and kind of tighten up my technical game on the guitar. And I think I influenced, if I did influence him in any way, it was that I was writing things on guitar as a non-guitar player, especially with my classical music influence, which, you know, he didn't, necessarily have you know until like later through his own self-education so he influenced me and kind of solidified me technically and I think I started to pull his way of thinking on the guitar away from the conventions of of Metallica and Hendrix and stuff yeah. so that's kind of I think one of the main ways that we uh influenced each other yeah man because I remember <laughs> I remember you telling me one time and it always blew me away because like you, you wrote, did you write Decrescendo in the UK? Did you? I seem to remember. Yeah, you I wrote. did. You remember that, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I totally it. did. Yeah, yeah Decrescendo yeah. Is, a, is a standout track for me, although I, I, I have different, I have tracks, our expanded track, uh, our expanded tracks that are above that in my like, um, you know, like totem pole of appreciation. But uh huh. Um, that track for me was the first track that I ever heard. And uh, uh, I was like, for, <laughs> I was contemplating whether I was going to actually tell this story. I hope my mom was, is not listening, but um, I, I was <laughs> absolutely s super high. I was off my face. Honestly, I was in the back of a car and I was with my friends and we were so, I was so happy. I was so like, bam, bam, bam. We were listening to music. And then they just put this track on. This track just came on. And if nobody's ever heard Decrescendo, it grabs you in, it straight away. And as soon as that came on, I was just like, da, da. And I was just like, woke up straight away. I was like, who the fuck are these? You know? And, and that was my, my introduction to, to like you guys. Did you say you wrote that or was that a collaborative effort as well between you and Matt? That one was a solid 50 50, but like the main musical signatures of the band I wrote, like meaning the main riff, yeah. uh, the rhythmic parts, like the end breakdown, uh, obviously my little guitar break solo. Yeah. Um, but you know, the verses and the choruses were, were Matt because we were just kind of like retrofitting it. I was just like, I have these rock out parts, you know what I mean? Like, like let's do something with him, with them. So when we were working the song up, he created like the rhythm and the halftime for the verses and kind of where he wanted to take the chorus for the chorus because he already had a, a melody in mind. So yeah, but I, I did write that song um, in England while we were on tour at the end of a tour in Brighton, actually uh, mm -hmm. sitting in our, in our tour bus. Like, have you ever been to the Concord in Brighton? No, well I never have. Venue. No, no. Okay. But I'm sure you've heard of it. To yeah, some degree. yeah. Like so yeah. many bands play that. Yeah. So, um, if you're not familiar, the Concord was like right off of the pier, like maybe 500 yards down. So like it just overlooks the water. Uh, our bus was parked in front. We had played a show the night before and we had a day off the next day. because we always like to take a day off in Brighton. It was a fun place for us to hang. We had friends there. It was like, it was chill. So, uh, you know, we had come back from small cafe having a breakfast or something. And I was just sitting up in the top of the bus 
which is second story in the back lounge, like overlooking the ocean, typical English, like overcast day, but yeah. still some sun <laughs> peeking through, you know? Um, and I had, even before the Mars Volta kind of championed it, uh, we had already been dicking around with material where I really wanted to infuse Latin tonality, Latin harmonies and melodies and chord uh, usage and scales into rock music mm -hmm. um, and punk and kind of so that was my first kind of mm, solid idea of doing that, especially that main riff, um, which obviously comes from being informed classically, like uh, in my younger years. So, yeah. Yeah, man, that's yeah. cool, man. Like um, just setting the setting the scene. Then I was with you all the way through. Yeah. That. I was just <laughs> like, yeah, that sounds like that, a quality life. Um, just uh, as you mentioned the Mars Volta, there, I was just wondering um, who were your other influences uh, you, yourself? You know, and it, not necessarily musical influences. Is there any sort of authors or any sort of films mm. or genres or anything like that that you you've been influenced heavily by? I would say so. Um, that's kind of like a much larger question than you would realize because of my personal process, which is I don't, I constantly have music that I'm hearing randomly, um, which I read actually recently is a form of schizophrenia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, well, you yeah, said before, no, you said before that uh, you, you were uh, bilingual and I know that, that, that staves off Alzheimer's. So you might have schizophrenia, but you're probably not going to get Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. But yeah, um, a lot of my songs have come from like, uh, how do I explain this? Uh, when I hear music in my head, it's generally not just like one instrument or a voice. Like I hear full arrangements and more often than not, I can't hold on to them or capture them. More often than not, I'm in the shower or at the grocery store and like literally a full part will hit me. <laughs> and then there's the times where it comes to me and I'm able to at least uh, plunk something out or sing something into my phone where I can retain like most of the idea. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, that said, when I'm actually putting together full music, um, I'm always having visuals in my head. So as I've said oftentimes before, a lot of our RX music and my music that I make is actually soundtracks to visuals and movies running in my mind already. Meaning I'm hearing music and then it sounds like something to me. So in my mind, I'm visualizing a scenario that is uh, happening around the music, which creates a lot of our working titles of our songs um, that sometimes become... Uh, actual titles on the album so how that pertains to your question as far as being influenced by other media and stuff is that there's like this multi medium process that goes on in my mind before it's even coming out and that's because i have been so largely influenced by people like kurt vonnegut um and movies like lawrence of arabia these kind of grand uh concepts on like large scales with uh, narratives that are like complex, but still directional, meaning they have a singular point that you can walk away with. Uh, I think things like that have been um, some of my greatest influences outside of music. Um, so hopefully I answered that question uh, effectively. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't what I was expecting at all. So you, what you're saying is you, these, because, I, the the more I uh, you know you sort of venture around your own head and like where are these thoughts coming from, you realize yeah. that they're sort of not coming from you. They're coming from somewhere, and you're sort of like an antenna picking up these these thoughts, uh, or as how you explained it, is these things just come to you, and it's a full arrangement, and and how you can't hold on to them, almost like a dream, like a a, a dream yeah. would would disappear you know you can remember it as soon as you wake up but right then it, it seems to float away and um i think that a lot of people seem to seem to have mentioned similar things about that and i think it's listening to your own thoughts and, and obviously you've yeah. developed that you've then been able to grab hold of just a little bit of it and, and process it and chuck it out to the world and then the world's caught on as well and um yeah. I, I think it's you know what you're saying is a beautiful way of explaining how we can change the world with what, you know, with what we think and, and we can put it out there for other people to enjoy and, and love. And I, yeah, no, you answered my question absolutely perfectly. Uh, I cool, saw a yeah. little video on your uh, Instagram 
um, with Matt and and you playing, and I could just see in the background Matt had sort of a, a row of guitars and a, a real nice studio setup. I could see see behind him uh-huh. where he was. I was just wondering, uh-huh. you know, he obviously likes his Les Pauls, and um, you seem to. Do you have a jazz jazz master? Is it a jazz master that you seem to be playing a lot? Um, what, yeah. What, yeah. What sort of equipment and um, you know it, it, do you like to use and and pedal boards and stuff and uh, and effects if you've got any you know ones that you're go to go to guitars and stuff like that as a general rule we are big analog and tube guys so you can kind of you won't really ever see us with effects processors like axe effects or no. uh, digital amp modelers and stuff like that so it's not really us like with us you'll always see tube amps and real pedals like with yeah. uh point to point connections and, and things you have to push. So um as far as like that technical side, that's the kind of stuff we prefer. Um as far as guitars go, uh you got a good eye. I definitely love jazz masters, play a couple of them. Um the one I've been playing most recently is slightly modified uh surf reissue one. So it's got like the floating tremolo tailpiece. Uh, and um Matt definitely, me, me and Matt are similar in that we we play Les Pauls for RX because it's the RX thing. And Les Pauls are amazing guitars. Um, you can't really say enough or say anything really bad about them, especially since like they were literally the first electric guitar. Yeah. And to maintain yeah. yourself and strengthen yourself nearly 100 years later <laughs> or over 100 <laughs> years later as like still such an iconic guitar, it's for a reason, you know? It's because they're amazing, amazing guitars. Um, but we both have love for Fenders. Whereas Matt really likes Strats because, you know, he has amazing guitar hands. I mean, yeah. God literally, if there, if there was such thing as a God, literally would have gone to him and be like, you're going to play the guitar or piano. I'm going to bless you with these fingers. <laughs> and then like, he came to me and was like, you're going to need dough or be a baker or some shit. Cause I'm going to be these <laughs> short little stubby Vienna sausage fingers. But, uh, he, we both love fenders and he favors the, the strats, you know, uh, with the larger necks and stuff and tellies. And I tend to favor jazz masters and Jaguars, uh, just because of the sound and, uh, kind of the way the necks are generally set up because like this jazz master I have is a smaller radius, the 7.25 radius neck, which is a little bit smaller than a lot, especially smaller than less Pauls and stuff like that. So, um, as far as guitars and amps go, there's that i have my own preferences as far as synths and keyboards and and all the other stuff and stuff like that but uh, as far as guitars and amps like that's generally the world we live in although yeah. like i'll never deny any good sounding instrument that plays well you know yeah of course um i mean the the thing about the the, the classics aren't they the classic guitars um and what i found is that even you know through styles like you say, you've you've uh, produced your own style, and the RX Bandits have definitely their own style. And even even so, you can get a, a person like Matt or like yourself, and you can put them on what is a standard a standard industry guitar, and they make it sound like themselves. Like you can still hear the player through the instrument. And I've always found that fascinating. Um, but uh, a lot of people obviously have to go through industry standard um equipment and uh, especially you two i've always seen that stood out in your playing it does they don't sound like the standard les paul sound when you hear them on the recordings and when you hear them uh, live they, they they sound like you two and i think that's that you know that's an amazing uh, feat to be able to accomplish now i don't know about that through a, a keyboard you know i don't know if that quite has the same feel because I, I, my ears don't work that way but definitely through the guitar you can definitely tell it's you two playing it and how you interplay together as well uh, is fantastic honestly I, I absolutely love it thank you i think that's one of the most flattering things for me to hear more than when people say like you guys shred or something is when people say something like you're able to take something so standard and make it sound so unique and so like signature to you like so thank you it's that's really one of the best compliments for me to hear you know what i mean where it's like great. I don't care whether what I do is bad or good because that's so subjective. But when somebody tells me like, you guys are unique, it sounds like you and stuff. I really, that makes me feel good and is really good for my self-esteem, you know? (laughs) Yeah, 100%. Like not just even the sound. It's like just 
uh, just the composition of, of of your playing, et cetera, and how you write, how you guys write a song as well. It is literally just you guys. You could tell, obviously, what we're full circle as well with Chris involved at times. But like you guys, man, you can just tell it's 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 unreal because it's a consistent through the records as well. Um, have you played any you, like have you got any standout shows you've played because you've played quite a lot of countries and festivals and small venues big venues have you got any of like your favorite shows any that stand out apart from literally the one this year <laughs> man I have a lot I have a lot um, just to help me sort through my memory bank could there be a continent continent uh, or a general like realm meaning like uh you know festivals or clubs or or whatever or do you just mean general anything that pops into my memory well i suppose so yeah i would say like but like small venues then you know like because i remember the for myself when i saw you i've never seen you at a festival and i don't know if the vibe is the same but at a small venue like I've never been to a more intense gig, you know, like, I don't know if that, I don't know. It's hard to ex- explain that to people like uh, within our expanded gig for me, when it was in a small room, I was just like, I lost my voice. Uh, I was like, I, I shed a ton of weight. In yeah, sweat. I like that. <laughs> Let's go with the small rooms because yeah. I love playing small rooms. So it, it's, I'm glad you said that because actually when you, when I think of small rooms, I think of the UK because huh. it took us so much longer to kind of, while we were able to build like a strong core following there, it took us a a lot of touring there before we could even play a slightly bigger place. So, um, I mean, there's so many places. The first things that come to mind are like Cavern Club in Exeter, which is like so small. Um, You guys know about that place, right? That's probably, it's generally a pretty well-known place. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not only a dungeon of a place underground, uh, (laughs) like on the high street of Exeter on one end of the high street of Exeter, but the whole place maybe holds 150, like maybe 200, which we've, they've overfilled that place for us so many times. Like the dressing room, if you can even call it, that (laughs) is literally like a large storage closet. And, um, all of my gear would just be completely soaked and disgusting, (laughs) especially like bands like us barely fit on that stage. But there was never a time we didn't leave just with a giant smile on our face. Like, yeah, I was bummed because everything I was wearing was just soaked and I had to just like change. But that's definitely one of them. Um, I mean, I know Underworld isn't really like that small, but when it's filled like Camden Underworld, like it had this small club energy, even though it fit maybe like 450 people or whatever. So that's another one like I really loved. Uh, I remember a show at a tiny um, little bar called the Ferry Boat in Norwich, like along their canal there. And we had a really sick show. It was hosted by like BBC Three or or I I forget which BBC it was or whatever, but it was like another small. Oh, and uh, uh, when we came over in 2013 to play Reading and Leeds, um, we played Camden Barfly as like a secret uh, unannounced right. show and that place is really small but that show was so much fun i had so much fun at that show so yeah those are some that come to mind directly just in just in england you know yeah Not man, even the whole uk just in england so they must be like because there's such energetic performances as well like I, I, there's got to be times as well when you just because i always think to myself you know when you know when you're like I, i'm very rarely ill and I, I, I presume you are too very rarely ill but when you get ill like i'm i'm just shit at being ill you know like i, I i'm just like oh my goodness <laughs> and have you ever been <laughs> have you ever been ill when it's come time to put on such an energetic performance and is there a, is there kind of a point where as soon as you start playing it just takes over anyway and you're just playing anyway that's exactly right, which is uh, a testament to the power of adrenaline and the power yeah. of kind of like that meditative focus that you get into when you get in that mind state, whether you call it flow state or mm. uh, primed mind or whatever. That's what all my meditation work is for, which is capturing that thing that playing music and being on stage always put me into. So, yeah, there, there's been a time totally where I've been sick and 
uh, not only does the show and sweating and the exercise help you, but kind of takes it away. The most recent example is uh, last February, I had H1N1, which is oh, shit, really? uh, swine flu. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you said it, I rarely get sick. It, I hadn't even had a cold in over five years, not mm. even a cold, you know? And uh, we started our first show on a Friday and we started rehearsals for Sound of Animals Fighting the previous Tuesday. And that previous, the Thursday before that is when I first got sick. So uh, although I wasn't contagious, by the time I was going up to Hollywood to rehearse with the band, um, I was still quite sick. When we had our first show in LA that Friday, I still couldn't really eat. I was nauseous all day, kind of dizzy, really just wondering how the hell I was going to make it through the set, you know, because um, if you're not familiar with Sound of Animals Fighting, it's kind of frenetic music. There's yeah. like high energy. There's some mellower songs, but, you know, it'd be one thing, like if I played in Wilco, I'd be like, I'm all good, bro. I'm just going <laughs> to chill, like, you know, play. But um, that, I really was worried. I didn't know how I was going to play, but, you know, even to the moment where our tech put my guitar on me and the lights go out and you hear the audience like start to roar and you're just kind of like that normal moment where you're just like, jittery and it's like i was still just like oh, I, I feel like hell yeah. as soon as i walked out there i just kind of forgot how crappy i felt and you know i didn't feel wonderful after the set but i felt a whole lot better than i did before so uh that's definitely real what you remember like it, it definitely happens how um how you i thought i catch you say you were meditating and have you implemented meditation into your, your daily routine or what other things do you do are you uh, uh, you know to keep your fitness and your health um, um yeah. well meditation comes because i have acute anxiety disorder um so i have really like debilitating panic anxiety attacks now I've always had anxiety my whole life as a child, but it always manifested itself in my gut, upset stomach, feeling yeah. nauseous, you know, mm -hmm. but about six years ago, five years ago, it took a much more extreme turn in my adult life. And I think a lot of it has to do with our over experimentation with certain substances and pills and stuff when we were younger. Um, but it started taking on the form of suffocating. Like I can't get enough air. I feel like I'm going to black out really debilitating. Um, so I started a mindfulness practice as a way to kind of deal with that. Um, aside from all of the other benefits of it, it's one of the key players in keeping me from not having my life overrun by my acute anxiety disorder. Yeah, um, so um, I do various forms of meditation. It's all like non-religious, like secular meditation. Um, yeah. But uh, it is just so crucial for me in maintaining not just my sanity and uh, memory and intelligence for being creative and being a good human, but for actually not having to be a slave to our medical, our corrupt medical system in America and pharmaceutical drugs so that I can live. Uh, exercise and mindfulness have been the biggest things for me and my panic attacks because uh, I've spent two weeks literally practically bedridden because everything was triggering it. You know, and, you know, especially at times like uh, when the pandemic first hit, I had a bad two weeks where even through the meditation, and everything, I was still suffering from a lot of panic attacks, anxiety attacks. So um, although it started because of that, it's really enriched my life and my mind. Uh, and so it's something that I'll definitely continue to use for the rest of my life. Uh, and I know a lot of people tune out when you talk about that. I don't push it on anybody through through ways. I'm not going to shove a crystal in your face because I'm talking about <laughs> how, uh, how much it's benefited me. But yeah, it, it's definitely a really powerful thing for me. No, I think um, I've, uh, I'm a paramedic. So I've seen a lot of people um, have anxiety attacks and I understand that the um, they're actually real and they're real on a biological level as well. Um, and the, 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 yeah. what you were describing then is, you know, I think most people or the majority of people don't realize that the panic attacks are real on a biological level. And they sort of think, oh, what are you panicking about? You know, you're fine. You're, you're sat in yeah. your room or whatever. <laughs> attacking you. And it's just like, 
it, it seems like quite woo woo to some people, but I did <laughs> a little does, yeah. uh, research into it and how the amygdala was triggering the hypothalamus and how that was affecting heart Precisely. rate and, and breathing yeah. and it's neurochemistry. And it's they found that, you know, like this um, meditation and this single state, putting yourself into a single state is actually the opposite of what anxiety is because that anxiety is the top down, uh, top down thinking. So you, you've got, you know, up to nine yeah. different things going on and you can't, you can't focus on one of them. Whereas if you can just center yourself and focus on one thing, whatever that may be, that is meditation. And a lot of, the best way to describe it is when you're reading a book and somebody says your name and all of a sudden you're back in the real world. You've been technically, you've been meditating because you've uh, been in this single divine place and you know, there's nothing. No, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think like you know, anxiety and everything, especially in the t- this time, this time, what's yeah. going on now, it's important to appreciate how much of a, an illness it can actually be, and how real it actually is. And what you were saying there just resonated with me. Is that you've seemed like you've biohacked your yourself to deal with I had to. what is a what is a new, new, neurological problem, you know, which is you know all all credit to you because some people do just turn to pills basically you know like chemical fixes we've been that too we've been that too for too long so yeah it was time uh like you said it's so real because the sympathetic nervous system is as real as your finger or your knee you know Um, oh yeah and this artifact of evolution which is our sympathetic nervous system and our fight or flight response it's the artifact proving in a way in my opinion evolution because that's the thing that kept us alive yeah yet it still exists in us today while we're not hunting while we're not having to run from any predators. So this is how it manifests, you know? Um, Studying it more, I I start to learn all the various triggers. Like you have a thing in your intestines called the vagal nerve. You had the trigeminal nerve in your jaw, which was one of my biggest triggers because I have bruxism, meaning I grind the shit out of my teeth. (laughs) And that was also uh, pinching my trigeminal nerve, which also uh, really was bad. So until I addressed my tooth grinding, it was even worse than it is now. So, um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I appreciate people like you that have studied the physiology of it because, you know, I mean, there are people that kind of are taking the piss with anxiety, like, Oh, I don't like something. It's making me anxious. And I always see those people, but you know, I don't really, I guess this is one of the only first or second time we're in a semi-public forum. I've discussed this, you know, but, um, for me, I, I don't, I'm the type of person where I don't really like to show weaknesses if I don't have to, you know, so I don't, I'm not, you know, uh, readily giving up this information like, Oh, I'm an, I have anxiety problems and all that kind of stuff. But, um, it, it unfortunately is a very real, real problem for me. (laughs) Yeah, no, obviously it's, you know, personal, personal to yourself, isn't it? And it, it, I think a lot of people are like that. And with what you were saying is exactly right, is that some people are anxious over, you know, is not what we're talking about as such and the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system and how to biohack them things through um, natural natural, um, remedies rather than uh, using the chemical remedies that, you know, I mean, there is obviously people who are on antidepressants and need chemical chemical remedies and i would never never discard them but i think if if you if you have to look into more of the the holistic side the meditation side the diet uh like you were saying the vagus nerve it's all connected you know that we know the good brain matrix and we know things uh, can make us inflamed and and cause uh, worsening of symptoms like anxiety right um and it's it's a massive field and it's really really interesting um, especially somebody that goes up on stage and plays in front of thousands of people. Yeah, <laughs> so it. like you would, you would, uh, you would think like because I know uh, I talked to my um, my tutor about it, and they were saying that even some of the best artists and, and musicians have been so debilitated by an anxiety that they've not been able to perform, not been able to, you know, express their art, and it's sure. just like oh, if you could only. If you could only, you know, uh, hack yourself to out of out of that, then you know. And it sounds yeah. like you've done that. So all appreciation to you. Yeah. Well, first Do of all, say- I, I I forgot to say uh, props to you for being a frontline worker, being a paramedic, man. Uh, my lady is an ICU nurse, so you guys uh, are all doing yeah important for sure. Work. 
yeah, she she feels the pain of the shift work and twelve hour shifts and the, yeah. the strain on the hospitals and obviously it's a private health healthcare system in the US as well. Yeah, so. which is completely failing us. So I've even gone out a few months ago to various Ma and Pa hardware stores to collect our own PPE because they stopped providing it for them and a bunch wow. of other things which we don't need to go into. But all yeah. I want to say is I appreciate the work you're doing. So props. Oh, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we don't need to go into that, but obviously I can imagine that you were saying due to the pandemic, your anxiety has got higher, but obviously if your partner's on ICU, uh, obviously, yeah. you know, the, these things are obviously going to put play, a, play she's, a part in it as well. She's the one in most danger because it, like, people don't realize that it's mainly only airborne when people are on ventilators and she's the one putting in the ventilators and taking them out and stuff wow, like that. So. Right. Yeah yeah props which props was to her. Yeah, yeah. Final a big word. part of my anxiety obviously which yeah. is not that i'm saying that i have more to worry about than anybody else but you know <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it definitely no, stressed me the fuck out <laughs> yeah i can imagine I can yeah imagine. i think it's i think what you were alluding to before as well like um it's it, it's it's so much easier now to be more aware of in a certain sense like you were talking about there joe biohacking and um because of podcasts, because mm-hmm. of, because of audiobooks, because of much more accessible things that you can. Because now I say this so many times. We're doing a podcast right now, but you know, like before, we just used to listen to the radio or what what was put on the TV. Now you can actually decide what radio you actually listen to. So you you're listening to so many different experts that you've never heard before talk before. And, exactly you know and i think that 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 opens a, a whole world of things that you didn't even realize was out there that teaches you to live in a certain way and i, I sometimes i just wish it was information that i knew or that i was uh, put in front of years ago you know like i mean but it, it is what you know it is what it is you know like um uh, but I, I find it so interesting to learn me and Joe, like we, we talk about it a ton, you know, all this kind of thing. Uh, there's a certain people out there like uh, Ben Greenfield's a big one for me just because I, I just any, yeah, infor- yeah, he is great. And any information he seems to put out or like Rhonda Patrick or people like that, it's so easily easy to consume. Um, it, some of it isn't, and it might take a few times of actually listen to it. And that's where you will like listen to one three hour conversation and then you'll listen to it again, you know what I mean? So it'll, it'll fall of in course. and then implement it into your life. Just, yeah. you can see it make a massive difference. Yeah. It's same thing for me because of podcasts. Uh, I was able to turn so many of my, uh, conditions around, you know what I mean? Um, thanks to people like in long form. Now, as you were saying, podcast is the radio but it's not completely um how should i say uh overrun by corporate interests you don't have all these advertisements shoved down your throat breaking it up constantly and you know uh people like us who are so hungry and for that knowledge you know we're the ones that go back and we'll listen to a Rhonda patrick or a peter atia or whoever it is yeah. episode you know two three times to get that stuff you know because when I'm like you probably, and I've seen through your own social media posts and everything, like how much on the same shit we are, because, you know, when she's talking about a certain enzyme or she's talking about choline and egg yolks and how it helps you absorb this or that cofactors and stuff. It's like, for me, I want to know all that. Like I write down notes. I'm like, this is how I'm kind of, because another thing that's easy to fall into in these days with over information is being just overwhelmed. And so you get these people that are like orthorexic and stuff like that, <laughs> afraid to eat anything and shit like that. And, uh, I think one of the most important caveats of taking in all this information is to create the responsibility for yourself to curate it all. You have to curate and cho- choose what you're going to put into your program and how it works for you, you know? And I think that, This is helping that because before this, there's so much of that, which uh, many other people have referred to as this tribal mentality, which is like, they take this one methodology, they just bang on about it. They bang other people about it. Like, you know, and it's just not only is, does it not uh, really serve the non-binary nature of the human physiology and life in general, it's just a clumsy way to be. Mm -hmm. Really, I think it's better for everybody to kind of, not only tailor things to themselves, but take that responsibility of curating all that knowledge, choosing what you're going to do, because, you know, there's people that aren't sugar-free that are just amazing athletes. And there's people that 
are eating all the right things and still are a little bit overweight or not feeling good about themselves. And it's just like, people are way too different, you know, but, um, to reel it all back in, I think that, uh, from what I've seen, we're on a lot of the similar things, you know, about what we're trying to do with our bodies and what we understand as basic principles and how much we enjoy getting that knowledge. It's yeah, fun man. for me. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really well put. Um, just to slightly deviate from, from what you're talking about there, what does the future hold then, Steve, uh, musically, you know, um, what are your sort of aspirations now? I know you're doing other side projects as well as uh, the Pandits. So what, what, what um, does the future bring? I do a lot of producing still. So I still yeah. work on music. Um, I do a lot of, uh, well, in the past year or two, I've been doing more music creation for hip hop artists. Um, so doing a lot of that. Um, I just had a release come out on Asian man records with Mike Park, um, with a band that he created a long time ago called the chinkies that I just wrote for, uh, ska punk songs for, and we just had that release. Um, as far as the future goes, RX is planning on doing some shows in the U S uh, my side project called peaced out, which is kind of like, Frank Zappa meets Converge on Acid and Shrooms. Um, <laughs> just put out a record uh, last month, and we're going to do some shows as soon as we're all able to. Um, but in the meantime, basically with musicians like me all around the world, just out of a job, meaning our, you know, it's like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe a clumsy analogy, but imagine it's just like you're a doctor and all hospitals just vanish. You just yeah, can't yeah, even have yeah. hospitals. Yeah. It's like... Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just trying to just hold steady and revert to what got me to this point, which is like rekindling a passion for just playing and creating music, not for are people going to like this? Can I sell this? Is this going to, but just because like, I like it. And I've been making a lot of headway um, in that realm in the past couple months. And it's really healed a big part of my soul because I lost a big part of that, like, like hustling in a band, battling the music industry, uh, just the whole nature of the music industry in America and already being such a cynic, like I really went a lot more negative with a lot of it than I realized. And so one blessing in disguise is this pandemic kind of stripping away everything else and literally re reverting me back to like the, 14 year old learning power chords, playing along the green day songs on the guitar. It's that spirit where I'm, I'm literally like just listening to Zeppelin one, two, and three, and just going through all the solos, just like, just cause I'm like, this is fun. Like I like playing it and doing and doing things like that. I've been making a lot of like videos of me just playing guitar, which I call relaxation programming, which is kind of just to help spread a mellow vibe. Even if somebody's scrolling and scrolling, kind of going internet brain, if they stumble upon me playing for 10, or they only tune in for five seconds, even though it's 30 seconds. If it gives them four seconds of peace where they can just break, like it makes me feel good to offer that. So those are kind of like the different ways that it's been manifesting and me kind of reconnecting with that uh, musical soul, like the character, the protagonist in the story that got this far, but totally lost the love and, and lost <laughs> why they're doing what they're doing. You know, um, yeah. I kind of fell in line with that a little bit. Yeah, and it's like it's very, it's, isn't it strange how like such, such a thing, such as this, can have a massive silver lining like for you, for your for your soul as such. Because I I found exactly the same thing. It's like hold on a second, we just bring it all right back down to what was what what was my purpose before the rat race. You know, like right. and I, I I I find that I found that, and I and I'm sure lots of people have, and it's it's obviously been an, an absolute horrible thing and it, it does set uncertainty into the future, but it's also been a, a, a bit of a sort of isolator as, as when it comes down to what, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it, you know, yeah. I'm, I, I do, I, you know, I, I enjoy this part of it. This is what I wanted to focus on originally. Let's just go right. back to this. And, uh, right. uh, you know, that, that's, you put it perfectly. And uh, I, I appreciate what you're doing there with trying to break people out of that, you know, high, higher 
level by playing some some melodic and, 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 and low low mood guitar playing to bring people down out of the the rat race as such the rush yeah so that sounds yeah. sounds sounds like you've got something from it yeah yeah because yeah, it's, it's like it's so, cool it's cool yeah. oh, i'm sorry go ahead lee no i was gonna say i wanted to say before because it is scary you know like um out of all the things to have happened in this pandemic it's like when you think of people opening back up and the easing lockdowns, et cetera, I know we said we weren't really going to touch upon this, but we're, we're doing it. When you're easing up on this and people start going back to work, I don't think I'm going to be back to work for another five weeks or so, you know, um, and when I do, it's going to be a stark contrast to what it was before. I'll be wearing masks, et cetera, and there'll be protocols right. in place. But the scariest thing for me is live music because like when it's the it's just such a, a, a an amazing thing to be part of uh, you will have you to be, to have sat and wa- to have stood and watched you play in your your band but then also for you to have stood and watched somebody else play and just be like oh my god you know i'm so immersed in yeah. this it's so important to be stood amongst all the humans and have that like heard heard vibe of just like oh my god you're feeling the love straight away and just to to not know when that really is going to be back i don't know it's scary like it's it, that's the one thing you know like that that freaks me out is like when will live gigs be back again yeah i wonder because you know even when this first hit it's uh i knew it would be the last thing mm-hmm. like even when everything is all good the last thing you can do is allow, you know, 60,000 people crammed together at the main stage of Coachella. Yeah. Like, that's literally the last thing you can do. And um, I feel you. I think it's such an important thing, you know. And yesterday we were all at the protest for Black Lives Matter and police brutality in downtown Long Beach. And there was 3,000 people down there. And, you know, one of the main things that I felt was people being like, it just feels so good to be around a bunch of other people all here for the same thing, which is exactly the same energy at live music. You're all there, mostly, you know, save for one or two out of every thousand for the same purpose. And I didn't even think that that was a factor. But when I went down there yesterday, staying cautious, staying away, six feet away from people. But even I felt that energy. And I'm somebody who does not like crowded places. It's another trigger for my anxiety. And even me, cynical hermit like musical like i'm just gonna lock myself away dude i was just like oh it reminded me i'm human and i need to be around other humans i need to give and receive love i need to remember that i'm part of a giant organism and not this individualistic western exceptionalism that's basically just force fed down our throats and it, it it's humbling it takes a huge weight off my shoulders it takes all this pressure and self-criticism away because then I can just for that moment go, I'm just another dirty, messy, stupid human being amongst all the (laughs) other billions and fuck whatever level of success or relevance or social media followers. If I can just live a good life, be happy, give and receive love and die when I want to die or around them, like I've had it great. And it's, it was it's really good for me. It's good. Yeah, for me. man. Honestly, I will say this as well. Like, regardless of live music, um, you, you know, there are yeah. countless bands and artists out there, but you, you have your, you and your band's music has touched so many people's lives, man. Honestly, it's been. I always say this, and it's so true because I heard it once, and now I say it, so it's mine. But it's like this: you, your certain albums that you guys made are just the soundtracks to certain parts of my life, and. It, like in particular and the battle begun i i love every single album you've done but that album for me for a certain period of my life when i think back to it i just i couldn't i could there was no other band out there at that point there was no other album to listen to um i say it like uh, i said it to joe like when uh d last in the cormatorium came out I felt privileged to be able to fucking listen to it. I was like, I can't believe there's humans out there that don't actually get the chance to listen to this. There's like that, that, that obviously don't have food, et cetera, but that not only that, they don't get to sit there and just consume such an incredible album. Not that they, they might not even want to when they listen to it. But for me at that point, it was so, we were so emotionally tied to it. So like with you guys, regardless of that, it will come back we will be back in a room again all just sharing the same love but 
their albums are out there and they're timeless. And no matter what, when I put it on and Crushing Destroyer comes on and it's just like, oh my God. And you're just riding the song. Like it's there for people to listen to for the rest of their lives. You know what I mean? I think it's, it's, it's amazing, man. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That's another one of those compliments that always really speaks to me is when people say like, you know, it was a big part of a period of my life that I look back on fondly, you know, and uh, that's a huge honor. I mean, you know, somebody's putting you, it's more than being on the wall in their bedroom. They're putting you into their existence when they appreciate your music like that. And so it's a huge compliment. Thank you. Yeah, because you will have done it. You know, like, I mean, I'm not like, I'm saying, I'm telling you my experience in my life. You will have done it. There will have been albums that have just been like, oh my God, this is just ridiculous. 1,000%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally, completely. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us, Stevie. I've, I've, I've got a lot from this yeah, personally. Um, and, you know, I wish you all the best in your journey. Uh, and hopefully one day we will see you on stage again and me and Lee will be there if you come yeah. to the UK. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. So, well, last thing, yeah, I think uh, hopefully, sorry, I'll let you talk in a minute. But yeah, hopefully okay. I was going to uh, push forward to that. Hopefully whatever happens, happens and you guys do your tour you you are able to tour through the u.s and something happens and you you either spark something together and decide to write something new that pulls you to the uk or something like that or you do an anniversary tour of mandala or something and it, we get a chance to see you live again in the uk and i get a chance to spend some more time with you and hopefully like this time i won't be causing you pain before you're about to go on stage or something like that <laughs> you know and we can just chill out and we can just eat some food or whatever but and it's Bro. fucking awesome thank you for coming on dude the pain you give is a gift <laughs> that you know, as you know, people are willing to pay for because of your talents and your abilities. So uh, maybe like somebody getting elbowed on accident in the front row of our concert, <laughs> it's just kind of like a fringe thing. The pain is the pain is not the focus. But thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate uh, having this really stimulating conversation with you guys. Uh, thank you for, you know, being good hosts. This Dude, has been great. No worries, Perfect. man. Right, well, stay safe, and I will speak to you soon. You guys too. Much love, guys. Good night. Take care.